these 40 days of breakthrough, which really is a word for the year, about a year of breakthrough that God has intended tended for his church, that we're going to see incredible breakthroughs in his church. But I think it's really important that, that we're reminded kind of where we left off last week, coming into this week, and I just want to, you to hear this, okay, that their desperation, all that's going on in the book of Joel, mirrors to a desperation, all that's going on that we can see very much in our own lives, in, in, in our country, in our struggles, we can see it globally. And the Lord says to them what he's going to do as a result of them turning back to him. And he talks about a former rain and a latter rain. Remember I said that if you looked at the drought for three years in California, also they were basically in a drought for three years. And then within a moment that God was going to restore what the locusts have eaten, that in a moment, just like the drought in California, all of a sudden an atmospheric river comes and they have too much water. <laughs> They're opening up the levees like there's too much. That we go, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? One year, what are we going to do? Two years, what are we going to do? And God's like, I'm going to do this. He restores time in a way that we don't know. In a moment, he, he makes up for lost time. And he changes everything. So this former rain comes, which is these, these atmospheric rivers, which California gets, we don't. Um, and um, we have nor'easters. They have you know, these major rainstorms. Millions of gallons of water are dumped. But they only come in the winter. Now, look, the former rain, former rain comes in the winter. The former rain's purpose is to beat down on that soil and turn everything over. The former rain is meant to flood. It's meant to come down in such a way, which I think is, is what God's doing right now, that, that his spirit's meant to come and disrupt our lives. It's meant to interrupt the things that we're doing. It's meant to disrupt things that are going on in our hearts, disrupt our hearts because we want them rendered before God. But then what he says uh, Joel says, the Lord says the former rain will lead to the latter rain, and the latter rain comes in the springtime, which is coming. And the reason the latter rain is so important is because that rain is what produces the harvest that's going to come forth. Soils turn, seeds are planted, new rain comes. That doesn't flood. That flows like a river, and it feeds everything. It's like a river of life. It feeds everything. Then he says that you'll have new grain, new wine, and a new oil, that you'll have more than enough, you'll have more than you could ever understand or imagine. This is part of what's going on in Joel, and part of what I believe God's leading us with the understanding of a breakthrough of what's taking place and what's happening right now and how his spirit is working within our own lives. So when we look at things like that and we look at really what's going on right now, we see there are these moments. Right now is a moment in time that's really important and in these moments, we have encounters, and encounters are really important. But the truth is, we, we have these encounters, and they change the direction of our life. Some encounters are not so good. They're bad. Then other encounters can be good encounters. A bad encounter is when we might experience a tragedy, a loss, a sorrow, a pain. That's a bad, that's a hard encounter to deal with, but it's a moment that changes the direction of our life if we have it. But then there are these, these good encounters that happen. And when a good encounter happens, that brings favor, a new discovery, that brings joy, and that brings delight. Encounters are experiences that affect us deeply either way. That's what an encounter is. It's this experience, it's this moment that affects us, changes directions in our life as a result of having that encounter. Joel and the people of God, they're, they're experiencing some bad encounters. It's not a good season in their life. There's a desperation going on. They need a physical need met in their life. They're going to starve to death and die of thirst. That, that they need rain desperately in their land. They need something to change. They, they, they need an encounter, and, 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 and they're experiencing a tough encounter right now, the famine and drought. And you know, in our own lives, you ever notice famine and drought spiritually comes unexpectedly? It's, it's not like, you know, well, here it comes. It's going to come, you know, a couple more weeks. No, it's usually here it comes. That's the hard encounter. But then there's a good encounter on the other side of that. See, for them, there's a clear sense of desperation, but there's not a clear pathway out. So, yep, I'm desperate, but nope, I don't know how to get out of it. I'm not sure what we do from this part. 
And we could relate to that. Now remember, Joel's speaking to the people of God. He's talking to the church. And what they were doing was going about living their lives in faith, enjoying God's provision, having all that they needed for sustenance. And they're going through their life, and busyness of their life starts to take place. Busyness of our life starts to take place. Now I'm talking to those in the church, those in the faith. That we have faith, but, but busyness comes, and, and, and these things start to happen in our life that, that, that begin to distract us or pull us back from God. Or maybe there's these disruptions that, that, that happen in our life. Then what happens is we begin to take our faith for granted. In other words, you know, we just start showing up, but nothing's really changing. We call ourselves Christian, but we don't pray or serve or give or share or, or any of those things. We, we say we're Christians, but we're far more in the world than we are in the kingdom. But yet we say we're Christians. That's what happened to them. Joel's people, Israelites, people of God, forgot God. And all of a sudden there's this desperation taking place. All of a sudden, there's a realization that, that something has to change. So Joel the prophet, he gets that word from God, and he calls to the people of God, and he says, here's the word. Here's what you need to do. No, you forgot God. We forgot God. We forgot him. We forgot him in the busy, busyness of all that we're doing, that, that we've gone through a ritual of worship, that we've rendered our garments, but we haven't rendered our hearts. We've, we've gone through the regular activities of the outward appearance. And God's saying, it's what I want to do on the inside that matters. It's what I want to do in your heart that matters. And then Joel says, look, the only hope is that we have to turn back to God with all our hearts. That's the only hope. He gives us where we have to turn back. He says, we have to repent. We have to rend our hearts before God. Remember, Joel's talking to the church. Joel's talking to the people of God who've become distracted through rituals, regular routines, and they're forgetting God in the process. They're distracted. They're busy. Sin's crept in. Sin begins to create a separation from God, not his separation from us, us to him, because he loves us in spite of our sin. But it creates this gap and he says, the only hope is we got to turn back. It's our only hope. And not just turn back lightly. we got to turn back with everything that we have, with our whole heart to God. So we have to repent. We have to come before God and say, God, come into my heart in that way. i got to confess the busyness and, and, uh, of my daily life. And i got to start seeking the Lord first again. And that's what's happening right now. That's a good thing. There's a, there's a searching again. So what do the people of God do when Joel gives this word? Ah, Joel, shut up. <laughs> we're just going to enjoy the nice drought we're in and <laughs> lack of harvest and we're out of wine. I mean, that's probably why they turned back. They were out of wine. They were like, we got to go back. <laughs> Vineyards are dried up. How do they respond? You know how they respond? They stop everything they're doing. They stop everything. They stop everything they're doing. And they commit to make God first in their life. They commit. And they begin to gather together in unity. They begin to support one another. They begin to lift their hearts together through worship. Lift their hearts together in prayer as they were coming before God. And it's from this place the Lord takes what was a bad encounter and he turns it into a holy encounter with a loving God. He meets him at that point of desperation. Isn't it unbelievably awesome how God meets us in our moment of desperation? He meets us in that moment. And if you're struggling right now, he's in your desperation. Trust me. And he's going to meet you in this moment. He promises not only to restore the physical needs that they have, but he's going to restore a spiritual need that they have, 
a greater spiritual need. He's going to bring this restoration to God's people. And it says in Joel chapter 2, 28 through 29, this is what he says, all these things, I'm going to restore the harvest, new wheat, new wine, new oil, which all represented pouring out of the Holy Spirit, by the way. But I'm going to restore physically the, 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 the fruit trees and, and, and the vineyards and, and the wheat, and, and, and it's all going to come back. It's all, I'm restoring all, I'm going to take care of every physical need, but more importantly, there's a spiritual need that needs to be taken care of that I need to renew in your life. So Joel has this word, and he says this, and it shall come to pass afterward that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also the manservant and the maidservant, I'll pour out my spirit in those days. That the power of God will move on the people of God and that it was going to be mighty and it was going to be profound in what he would do. In that moment and in moments to come. See, God promises us. He promises restoration, renewal, and a reward for his people. He promises those things. Now, if we fast forward 1,500 years from that moment, to give or take, because they're not sure exactly when it was written, 400, 600 for Joel, but give or take, fast forward 1,500 years, God fulfills his promise in the Old Covenant, and he sends the Messiah. Jesus comes. He fulfills the promise. Then Jesus comes. He teaches what? We have to repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, that we have to be ready and then he goes about and he confronts the Sadducees and Pharisees who are the people of God. And he's saying, you got to turn back to God. And then, he, so he teaches that. And then he heals the sick. He casts out demons and he raises the dead. The disciples, the apostles, they're following the Messiah who's come. They're trying to discover if this is him is this the one that God promised? And in the midst of that, Jesus tells them a further promise in all that they've experienced with him. This is what's to come. He promises this in John 14, verse 12. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Anyone who believes in me. Wait, Lord, you mean heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead? Yeah, same works. No other work. Those works. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done. Then Jesus, I think he paused at this moment. He was like, oh, hold on. I'm getting a word from the Father. He says, not just same works. They'll do greater works. And they'll do greater works because I'll go be with the Father. And I'll send my spirit. And there'll be greater works that they'll live out in their life. So Jesus ascends to the Father. Disciples go back to the upper room. This is towards that, that his work on earth is completed. He's entrusted. He's passed it over to now the apostles. And they, they go to the upper room. Uh, and they begin to uh, wait upon the Lord and uh, I know that in the upper room, what they did was they cried out through repentance that they were fasting and there was a sacred assembly, just like Joel. They were doing the same thing. That's how they gathered in unity with one another. And it says, as they spent that time together, as they were in that moment of rending their hearts, turning back to God, making room for God through fasting, coming together through sacred assembly, raising their hands in praise and worship and adoration and singing songs of praise. They're waiting upon the Lord. It says then suddenly something changed. Suddenly an encounter happens that they experience something they've never experienced. Jesus said, you're going to have greater works. Here they come. And it's, it's, it's something that will transform their life for the rest of their life, but will also begin to prepare them of what's to happen in their ministry to come. So this sound from heaven, a rushing wind, tongues of fire, speaking in tongues all takes place. And, 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 and it says immediately when this happens to them, as they were going through that process of waiting, it says they left the upper room and they went out to Jerusalem. And, and, and Jerusalem was packed because it's the Feast of Pentecost. And people are from all different uh, nations, tri uh, tribes, and places around Jerusalem that would come together. And they burst out of this upper room, about 120 people 
who are now transformed, who've now had a holy encounter unlike anything they ever encountered before. That, that promise, you'll do the same works, now the greater works are to come, they're being poured into their life. A sound from having a rushing wind, it's unlike anything anyone ever experienced. And, and they go about and they leave the upper room and, and they're walking around and they're encountering people and people said these wonderful works of God are incredible. What is God doing? Some believed and some doubted. It always happens. And the doubters accuse them of being drunk. <laughs> they're drunk. That's what happened. And Peter, who's filled with the Spirit, stands up to the crowd, and he, he begins to preach the kingdom of God. He begins to do the greater works, just as Jesus did. He begins to deliver the message of what Jesus came to do and the truth and the fulfillment of the old covenant is happening right now in this moment. And he addresses the crowd. He says, they're not drunk. That, 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 that's not what happened. It's too early in the morning. This is not what's taking place. You might doubt, but this is something far greater that's happening in their lives right now. And then Peter says, matter of fact, it's just as Joel promised us would happen. It's just as it happened in Joel's time, it's happening again for us. That this is being fulfilled. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, is actually Peter quoting Joel of God's promise of what he would restore, but the greater restoration of the power of his Holy Spirit. And then Peter just quotes Joel. And he says, it shall come to pass in the last days. They'll pour out my spirit of all flesh. He's saying, listen, this is what God said he was going to do. This is what God is doing. Sons and daughters, they'll, they'll prophesy. Young men, they'll see visions. Old men, they'll dream dreams. And my men servant and my maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit on those days. I'll pour it out in such a way they should prophesy, that they'll have this revelation that my greater work is alive in them. Joel's prophetic message to us is timeless, just like all scripture is alive. And his message is timeless, and his message is for such a time as this for us. That God's telling us right now, of something that's been fulfilled, but he's continuing to fulfill in this moment. It's a message in Joel of what he was doing, what he will do, and what's ultimately to come and be fulfilled. It's the beginning of the last days, or understanding that, that in this moment, it's an act of salvation that God promised by pouring out his Holy Spirit. That's the beginning of the last day as he poured out his Spirit upon his people. Now, God pours out his spirit, it says. I'll pour out my spirit on all what? All flesh. So what does that mean? I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh means to every gender, to every age, and to every class. That I pour out my spirit on everybody. I pour out my spirit on everybody who's willing to receive. And then he says that they'll prophesy. What does that mean? Well, it just means a word from God on what's to come. You'll have a word from God that... And they were doing these things in that moment and beginning to prophesy what's to come. Then he said they'll have visions, that they'll have a revelation from God that will affect change. And then finally he says they'll have dreams, which are, is images uh, given while, whether sleeping or awake. Because the greater work of the Spirit is active in our lives, that these things should just be happening. They weren't just for Joel's time or 2,000 years ago, they're for right now, for the church. For the church to have hold of that. And the Lord's moving powerfully right now in our church. And what the Lord's moving powerfully in is in, in answered words that we've received in prophecy and visions and dreams and spiritual gifts. See, the enemy's trick on the people of God is to somehow get us to believe that we're powerless. That we, have, we don't have any tools in our tool bed to combat him. When Jesus says, man, you're going to have greater power than I had if you want it, if you choose it. And the Lord's moving powerfully. He's answering words in these last years that we've gotten from God. The Lord said early on, you create a form and I'll fill it. Why? Because God doesn't bless chaos. So we create a form. 
Yes, Lord, obedient to those things. He said, I'll pour out a new wine into what? A new wineskin. That's his spirit into a new wineskin, one that's made new and whole. That he's, he's spoken to us that how he was going to prepare a place, that, that the way he was begin to, for us to prepare a place for those that he would begin to send. And we would just listen to God as he would reveal those things, whether in visions or dreams, that God continues to speak those things. And all the way to the point where we were in prayer one time and the Lord told me that there was going to be a reformation to the church again and that there would be like a second Pentecost. And this was months ago. And that's what God's doing. He's doing those very things. And when I sat in Hughes Chapel at Asbury, I had a holy encounter with God. Now, here's what you need to know. It's not like I quit praying before I went there. It's not like I quit doing all the things that I would normally do. I loved God, and God loved me, and I was pretty cool with that. But I did desire something more. I did desire, God, that there has to be more for your people. And my heart was heavy for God's people. And the God's people need God's power. And I knew that, God, you have to do something in the midst of your people. And in that holy encounter, what took place is God pouring out his Holy Spirit. He poured it out on those who hungered and thirst for him. And what God's pouring out right now is available to everybody. But you got to hunger and thirst. Because it's there, but you can also reject it. See, we can encounter his holiness. We can encounter his purity. We can encounter his love. And it's meant to all happen at the same time. It's, it's a closeness to God that we get that changes us. That's its point. That's the encounter. That I get closer to God and become more like him and less what I used to be. That's what he desires for us as he draws us close. Then he gives us a new direction. And then he gives us an empowerment that didn't exist before. That there's a new way he's going to work or operate within our lives. That's what he's calling us to do. We encounter those things. He gives us a new direction. That we have this empowerment. God's meeting us in these moments just as he met them in those moments. So what does that mean? Well, we know that when we look at this, there's a breakdown. There's a break in. Then there's a breakthrough, which leads to a breakout. And that's what God's doing. Right now, all those gifts he's given are for what's to break out in our life. And when it breaks out, it's about sharing the wonders of God free from any restraints. That he would share those very things that, that he breaks out of our life because of what he's done. That, that he has these spiritual gifts just like then for now. That there's vision and dreams, that there's healing and deliverance that he wants us to participate in. Just like then, he wants to do right now, that these gifts that, that he's breaking out through our lives. You see, you, you know, the greatest gift at Pentecost wasn't just the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It was the 120 who left the room. See, when they had a holy encounter, they didn't lock the door and go, wow, this is great for us. We're so glad the Holy Spirit's here just for me. And I'm so glad, hey, Peter, would you pray for me? Sure. Peter prays for one of the other apostles, disciples, and they pray for the other person. Do you realize if they never left the upper room, we wouldn't be sitting here right now? That it had to break out. And that's what its intention was. This encounter that you receive is one that you break into someone else's life with. So it begins that same process. It's something so profound that happens that we can't contain it. It's something that moves us from doing nothing about certain situations in people's lives to becoming part of the situation in people's lives. Breaking out means when, when someone is, is hurting, you come in and you bring peace in the midst of their storm. Breaking out means that when you're standing online for your cup of coffee and all of a sudden God says, hey, wait a moment, i got something in store for you right now. Wait. Breaking out is when you're pumping gas and someone approaches you and asks you a question. God's saying, I have something in you for them right now. See, breaking out isn't something that just happens when we get together on Sunday. Breaking out is about a holy encounter we have that we can't contain. 
but all we could do is want to bring it into someone else's life. Bring those gifts to life that God's given us. Joel goes on in verse 32, chapter 2, and he says, it shall come to pass. In other words, this is going to happen, and then this is going to happen. This will come to pass, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That there's salvation for those who will call on his name. He says, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. There's going to be truth. There, there shall be a freedom. As the Lord said, among the remnant, the Lord calls. Now, that's one of the words the Lord gave me. When I looked out at the church and I see the church decimated by a pandemic, I see people deconstructing their faith. I see people so caught up in, in arguments in the world that they don't pray, they don't go to church. And, and I, I see anger and I see frustration. I, I see discord. I see all these. This is in the church, not out of the church. That there's a stirring that happened somehow. God says, it's okay, Brent, I'm going to use this. Watch what I do because I've always built my church on a remnant. World's not behaving? All right, Noah, build an ark. Aren't we grateful he's not going to do that again? <laughs> the opposition's coming against you? Gideon, I know you got an army, but go from 30,000 to 300 and watch what I can do. It's a remnant. All throughout the scriptures, God used a remnant. Joel quotes that. As the Lord has said, it's among the remnant who the Lord calls. And the Lord's calling us with a remnant. But for a greater work. A greater work. A breakout work that he has for us in his church to participate. Just like then. Just like in Joel. Just like at Pentecost. Just like now. It's timeless what God's doing now. This, this same holy encounter is for all those who are willing to call in the name of the Lord. That's who it's for. We see this remnant God always rebuilds on. And right now, right now, is one of those moments that allows us to participate in history. Right now is a moment that we can participate in the history of of God's church if we call on his name. For a holy encounter where we break out and we continue that work on earth that Christ has called us to do. So I have a message. You hear me in this. If you've turned away from God, I urge you to turn back. If you're lost right now, if you're lost, I urge you in this moment, come to salvation. God hears your voice. God brings salvation to those who call upon him. Particularly in such a time as this, God has an incredible encounter. Here's what I do know. Time is short. Always has been. Except when you're really young. You think time's forever. You get a little older, you go, wow, time's getting short. Time is short. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. Joel says it's the day of the Lord. It's being fulfilled. We're in that day of the Lord now. And what I know right now, what the Lord wants to do is meet us exactly where we're at in this moment. And will I allow him to meet me in this moment right now? Will I get my heart right? Will I prepare myself? Why? Because of greater work. Isn't that cool? God says, I'm going to do a greater work in you. I'm going to do a greater work right now in you. I want to bring such an encounter in your life that you're transformed, that your life is forever changed. And the holy encounter that he invites us to right now is to discover his incredible love that's made known to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do pour out your power, you do pour out your love, and Lord, that we can meet you right where we're at, God. But we know it begins with rending our hearts, which means, Lord, there's repentance involved. Just as Joel said, you have to turn back to God. So we too. We receive that word knowing we need to turn and begin to follow after you. Lord, I pray for the courage in this room right now to be led towards repentance, meaning that those who maybe have never even done it, God, never made a decision would begin now in this moment to make a decision to recognize who you are and to follow after you.